The story of the F-107 begins not on a runway or in the skies, but rather at the drawing boards and meeting rooms of North American aviation. Initially, the aircraft was a bold, ambitious project without an official Air Force designation. It was the company's foresight and commitment to innovation that gave birth to this concept. North American aviation's engineers and designers had the foresight to envision a successor to the F-100 Super Sabre, aiming to harness its potential while addressing its limitations. As the design matured and garnered interest, it eventually received the official designation of F-100B, a testament to its lineage and evolution from the esteemed F-100 Super Sabre. At the core of the F-107 was its strategic design, tailored for multifunctional combat scenarios. One of its standout features was a recessed weapons bay positioned under its fuselage. This bay was meticulously designed to house a variety of munitions, allowing the F-107 to seamlessly switch between conventional bombing runs and strategic nuclear strikes. Additionally, six hardpoints were engineered beneath the wings. These hardpoints gave the aircraft versatility in carrying auxiliary fuel tanks, air-to-air -air missiles, or additional ordnance, making it a formidable asset in both air superiority and ground attack roles. This combination of a central weapons bay and wing hardpoints showcased the F-107's commitment to adaptability and potency, encapsulating North American aviation's vision for a next-generation tactical fighter bomber. The dawn of jet aviation brought with it a myriad of challenges, and managing control at supersonic speeds was paramount among them. For the F-107, this challenge was met head-on with its state-of-the-art automated flight control system. This system wasn't just a testament to the technological prowess of the era, but also to the ingenuity of the engineers behind it. It was meticulously crafted to offer pilots a seamless interaction with the aircraft, ensuring stability and precision even when pushing the boundaries of speed. The 1950s, at the height of Cold War tensions, was an era that demanded innovation in both design and strategy. The dorsal-mounted intake of the F-107 wasn't just a stylistic choice, but a solution born from necessity. The U.S. Air Force's requirement for the aircraft to carry an underbelly semi-conformal nuclear weapon meant traditional intake designs were out of the question. By positioning the intake atop the aircraft, North American aviation accomplished a twofold triumph. Firstly, they ensured the aircraft could seamlessly carry its nuclear payload, a vital aspect in the high-stakes game of Cold War deterrence. Secondly, this unique design improved aerodynamics, reducing drag at supersonic speeds. It's a shining example of function meeting form. The dorsal intake didn't just give the F-107 its distinctive look, but made it a highly efficient high-speed machine. Though this design did pose challenges, such as limiting the pilot's rear visibility, it was a trade-off for a jet built in an era where long-range missile exchanges were expected to dominate aerial combat. Hey there! I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for watching and supporting this channel. You're amazing. I'd like to introduce you to Super Thanks. Your Super Thanks donation not only helps me create more awesome content, but also gets highlighted in the comments section. Just click on the Thanks button below this video and leave a small tip in your local currency. Let's grow together, and thank you for being a super supporter. Now back to the video. The early aspirations for the F-107 weren't limited to design concepts and airshow dreams. Concrete plans were set in motion in August 1954, when a decisive contract was inked, greenlighting the construction of three prototype aircraft. These prototypes were to serve as the foundation, a testament to the innovation and capability of this new machine. Furthermore, there was an optimistic order placed for an additional six pre-production airframes, signaling a confidence that the F-107 would be the next big thing in the Air Force's arsenal. Among the considerations was even a two-seat variant, a tantalizing prospect that hinted at the aircraft's adaptability for various mission roles, though this version remained confined to paper. The buzz around the F-107 was palpable and the momentum behind the program signaled an aircraft poised to redefine the era's tactical aviation. On September 10, 1956, the F-107 took to the air for its maiden flight. Test pilots and engineers watched with bated breath, their years of hard work, innovation, and challenges culminating in this pivotal moment. While the flight was a monumental success, symbolizing the F-107's potential, it was not without its hiccups. A malfunctioning brake chute on landing led to a bent nose gear strut, a reminder that pioneering new aircraft often came with unexpected challenges. Nevertheless, 
The resilience of the design and the skill of the pilot were evident. Over the following weeks, the F-107 continued to push its limits, with speed tests recording remarkable performances. By November of the same year, the second prototype was ready, taking on the challenge of various weapons tests, including conventional and atomic bombs. The rapid succession of test flights, each offering its own learnings, culminated in the third prototype's flight in December, further solidifying the F-107's place in aviation lore. The mid-1950s was a golden era for aviation, brimming with potential and competition. As the North American F-107 made its mark as an embodiment of aeronautical innovation, it was not without formidable competition. Enter the Republic F-105 Thunder Chief, another state-of-the-art tactical fighter bomber, developed with similar ambitions and during the same epoch. Both aircraft aimed to address the U.S. Air Force's needs for a reliable, potent, and versatile fighter bomber capable of delivering both conventional and nuclear ordnance. The juxtaposition was evident. The F-107, with its unique dorsal intake and lineage tracing back to the F-100 Super Sabre, versus the F-105 with its own set of advancements and capabilities. Both aircraft underwent rigorous evaluations, including flight tests, weapons compatibility, and operational simulations. Decisions at such a juncture were not just about technological prowess, but also strategic, logistical, and economic considerations. In the end, after comprehensive assessments, the scales tilted in favor of the F-105 Thunder Chief. The U.S. Air Force saw in the F-105 a platform that aligned more closely with their evolving tactical requirements. This crucial decision inevitably altered the trajectory of the F-107, marking the beginning of its journey away from mass production and widespread operational deployment. Though the initial pre-production order for the F-107 was brimming with promise, it was, regrettably, cancelled. But this decision wasn't a repudiation of the F-107's capabilities. Instead, it exemplified the complex interplay of factors that determine an aircraft's fate in the fiercely competitive world of military aviation. The life of the F-107, albeit brief, was nothing short of eventful. Though its operational tenure lasted a mere year, the F-107 was not an aircraft that could be easily forgotten. In that short window, it contributed significantly to our understanding of supersonic flight, aerodynamics, and combat capabilities. Engineers, pilots, and ground crews, all who had the privilege of working with the Ultra Sabre, often spoke of its unique characteristics, its potential, and the dreams it carried. By November 1957, as the sun set on its active service, the F-107 left behind not just trails in the sky, but an indelible mark in the annals of aviation history. While its operational journey might have been curtailed, its legacy was immortalized, becoming a symbol of a time when boundaries were continuously challenged and the sky was merely the beginning.